Hello everyone, this is Jacob Popio, the producer of The Apex. In this episode, Jan sits down with Pallavi. She is the CEO and founder of Candor, a Salesforce consulting firm in Washington, D.C. Her passion is finding ways to help clients determine their true path. She believes that it's about business process and understanding the why of the user experience and customers to really drive the business outcomes for clients. She has over 15 years of management consulting experience. She enjoys traveling, hiking, and biking. She is also passionate about mentoring women in the community for personal and career growth and leads the DC Admin Salesforce Group. Learn more and have a little bit of candor in your life. Visit www.kandercon. S-U-L-T dot com. If you want to support us, there are three ways to do so. One is to donate to our cause at www.patreon.com backslash the Apex podcast. Second, visit our merch line that is proudly partnered with Envision Clothing Company at envisionclothingcompany.com. The final one is completely free. All we ask is if you learn something from this episode or know someone that needs to hear our message, share it with them. Please subscribe and hope this pushes you toward your Apex. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Apex Podcast. As always, I am your host, Jan Almasy, and today we have another Indie Collective member with us. I know that you guys have been hearing from a couple of these amazing cohort members from the course that I took earlier this spring, but I'm bringing back another one, and there's probably going to be another one after that because they're all phenomenal individuals. And today, our guest is an executive management consultant with over 13 years of experience managing large-scale business transformations to the cloud. She's focused on helping clients find their true north with proven methodologies in business strategy, program management, and application implementation. She's passionate about understanding the why at the root of a company's needs, and she additionally has worked with charities that provide small business skills training for women in East Africa and has raised funds for the Special Olympics. Everybody, please meet Miss Alavi. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to have you. So um, for everybody that's listening, let's just start with where you're located in the country currently. Beautiful Washington, D.C., in the heart of it all. Nice. <laughs> that's, I, I think it's so cool that there are applications like this, you know, squadcast.fm, shout out to them that allow us to communicate, you know, I'm here in Canton, Ohio, and you're down in DC, and we're about to record a podcast. Yeah, this is amazing. You know, Technology at its best. Uh, yeah, yeah. I um, So one thing that I always like to start with, just so that guests can get a little bit of background on who you are, you know, and kind of get an introduction to you, why don't we talk a little bit about um, just where you're from, how you grew up, and, and we'll kind of end with how you got to candor you know, okay. selecting that word and building that consulting firm. I know that's a long stretch of time. So, you know, start wherever you would like. Yeah. So I'm actually originally from India, born born and raised slightly over there. Then moved over here to America in the DC area pretty much all my life. And, you know, after I went to college locally at University of Maryland, College Park, Coterps. And then I just trajected my career from there. Uh, I got into consulting right out of college, uh, joined Accenture, was there for about six years, then jumped over to Deloitte for a little less than a year because when I jumped over to Deloitte, I'd already applied for my MBA and I got accepted. So I had to leave Deloitte in a short, short period. And I moved out to California to UC Irvine, go dot dot, and um, did my MBA out there, stayed out there, went up to San Francisco, worked in some startup consulting firms, learn about the cloud. It was a very hot term at that time. <laughs> it was um, around 2012, 2013, where you know companies were still doing ERP, but they were starting to take those ERPs into a cloud platform. And that's when I realized I really needed to stay, stay fresh in the industry and not make myself a dinosaur within, within a few years. And I really caught on to this cloud technology and started my career in cloud CRM based just out of default with the clients we were with. And then they started. And so, 
just for everybody listening, could, let's let's go ahead and explain what ERP means and why the cloud was so like revolutionary at the time. Yeah, um, ERP enterprise relationship. I don't know. I can Google it too. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what ERP. I know I should know what that means. But basically, ERP were, was where software was more standalone. Like it was still connected on servers and on-premise servers. So someone still needed to manage it and companies had to plug in the software in an enterprise level. And Enterprise resource planning. That's what it stands for. Sorry? Enterprise resource planning. That's yes. what it is. Um, yeah, because there's also ERD, I was thinking of enter- entity relationship diagrams. There's so many different things. It gets all mixed in. But yeah, so ERP systems like, you know, you had your Oracle, your SAP. Oracle was huge back then, and in the in the U.S. for the most part, as well as SAP. SAP was bigger in Europe. Everyone was in, implementing one or the other to help manage their company, and it was more where you had to have on premise. Cloud basically removed the on premise, where it allowed to be able to a access your data from anywhere at any time but be the management of the servers and the data was also reduced by having uh, server farms where you could rent space and have your data loaded. And that's the very layman's terms of the way I can explain technology. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, if we were to dive too far down that rabbit hole, we'd be there. Yeah. And I wouldn't do, just, I wouldn't <laughs> do justice to it at all. So, so anyways, yeah, I, I got into cloud and then CRM, which is, Customer relationship management is really where my career trajected. So I was doing more federal consulting prior to that, where we were installing ERP and having custom supply chain management systems built and for different uh, federal agencies. And then I went into commercial. And when I got into commercial, that's when I was exposed to CRM and cloud. And after that, I realized cloud technology was not like just a flavor of the month. It was really the next wave. I started seeking out cloud companies and then I jumped to Oracle CPQ. CPQ is um, configure price quote. A lot of B2B businesses use that today. I got involved in that, learned a lot about the cloud technology space through that. And then I went over to Salesforce and I started doing consulting for a firm that represented Salesforce Consulting. Now, Salesforce, they really kind of disrupted. Was it more cloud or CRM when they first got us started? Because I know everybody kind of thinks of them as just like, at least the when when I was first trying to look into Salesforce, my initial impression was like it was like CRM and other stuff like that. But I know that they're into so many different things. You know, it's mostly like driven, complete cloud transformation. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so it was, it started off as CRM. That's why if, and if you look at, um, look at their uh, stock symbol, it's CRM because that's really what they were known for. And that, you know, a lot of mis, um, misnomer around CRM, customer relationship management is it's about sales, sales and uh, figuring out your pipeline, getting leads bringing in those opportunities, winning the deals, and the buck stops there. But that's really not not the truth of it, right? CRM is an ecosystem of many different levels and aspects of how to run a business. So yes, sales is a huge component of it, but then there's a marketing component to it. There's the actual delivery component. There's the analytics component to it. There's an HR component to it. There's, there's multitudes of components, and that's kind of where... Salesforce as an ecosystem has really taken off and disrupted the industry a little. Yeah. So that actually leads me into an interesting question. You know, I, from the first time I saw your company after we met at Indie Collective, um, I was instantly curious about the word candor, you know, and how you came up with that. And, and for everybody listening, you know, what that actually means as a word and why it's important to the way that you do things. So why don't we speak a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. I feel like I need to write a blog post of why candor, but um, I really wanted to name the company something that represented me as an individual, but also like the culture and the tenets of what the company needs to represent. So I actually did a lot of research one night. I stayed up and I was just like looking at 
words that represented me and using the thesaurus, trying to figure it out, trying to find definitions that resonated, and then seeing if the domain was available too, right? There's always the domain game you have to play. Yeah. Yeah. So, so over, as I did, I loved Candor, what it stood for. And, you know, a lot of my clients who I used to work with in the past, when they learned that I started uh, Candor, they asked why. And I told them it's the word Candor. And they just laughed because they were just like, that's so you. Like, so honest, transparent, to the point, not not BSing anything, just, you know, saying it how it is, which is which is actually like surprisingly not that often you find people who do that anymore because we're so scared of what other people might think if we're representing, you know, the social norms or not. So I really loved that word and I just cho- chose to spell it differently just to be play around and have some fun with it and then that domain was available as well. So it all worked out. Yeah, I love how like sometimes um like people, I feel like sometimes like ideas are gifts or like you stumble upon something that just resonates with you. Like, you, you know, you put yourself into that mind space of doing research and engaging with the thesaurus and almost like, you know, going on a journey to find this name. And, you know, like for Apex, I didn't come up with Apex at all. I was just sitting on a C-130 talking to my colonel and he said, the apex of my life is my death. And that became a speech which later became Apex Communications Network. You know, it was like this non-linear path. Mm -hmm. But people always ask me, like, oh, how did you like how did you come up with the name? Like, you know, you must have spent a lot of time on it. And I was like, ah, actually, I don't know. It was just kind of handed to me. Yeah. You know, I I did a little bit of uh soul searching after I heard that statement, but that I I look back at that statement, I'm like, wow, that was cool. It just kind of showed up. Yeah, candor was an overnight thing. I remember like I had guests visiting, so they were they were sleeping in um, in the in my in the main bedroom, and I was on the air mattress downstairs. <laughs> and I was just like a good hostess. Yeah, <laughs> and I was just like, okay, well, I really I really want to start my company. I know I want to have a company one day, and the idea that night just popped to like try to figure out my company name. And I remember just laying on my like laying down on my phone on my notepad and my phone, writing a few words that mm. just. Me, which was like loyalty, honesty, and um, and honesty is what like put me in the rabbit hole of and how I found the word candor because I looked up the word honest and I saw a few words in the thesaurus and the synonyms and it led me to candor and I just loved it. Yeah, that's cool. I I, I always um I love I love hearing stories like that and I love having other people hear stories like that because it really brings back down to earth that entrepreneurship happens in everyday circumstances. You know, it's not like you were in an office whiteboarding something at two o'clock in the morning, you know, because, you know, grind culture or whatever internet perpetuation there's been, you were, you know, on an air mattress on your phone with a notepad at like one o'clock in the morning. trying to figure stuff out, you know, yeah. because you got, I, I, did you feel like, like an intuitive feeling like, Oh, I need to do this. Or was it just like, you feel like curiosity just kind of drove you to, to decide to start looking through the thesaurus. It was a bit more intuitive because at that time I was also job hunting and looking for my next step. And I, I had been given like a potential, it wasn't an offer, but it was a conversation I had with someone where they were like, hey, would you want to be independent? And that kind of stirred all those thoughts that if I'm going to be independent, I should probably have my company rather than just be independent. Mm. And then that night, and that was like a couple of weeks prior. And then that night, that thought just turned into the seed that grew into like, let me go down this path since I'm not sleeping anyways. And right. really come up with that. And that right. was in um, 2014. 2014, 2015 timeframe. And I didn't start the company until 2018. So even the start of the company, it's like, everyone's like, oh, when did you start the company? I'm like, I started in 2018, but I came up with a name like years before that. And it popped yeah. it years before that. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's always, that's always something that surprises me when I talk to other entrepreneurs too. It's like, you know, I, I feel like um, 
at, there's there's an analogy that athletes use all the time that you know instant success or like becoming viral or something like that is not there's no such thing as overnight success right it's like all of the nights training and all of the thought that went into it and the years of preparation and i um i talked to a couple of people that feel as though you know when they have conversations with people that have never really experienced um, entrepreneurship or they don't have the mindset um, of entrepreneurship and they're like, Oh, you know, you had that one idea. And then obviously that idea led you to the next one. Cause in 20, in hindsight being 2020, it does sometimes seem logical the way that we approach things. But for most entrepreneurs, it's like, no, I had an epiphany and then I let it sit in the back of my mind or I developed it over a course of time. And then I executed on it later. Our ability to play the long game is just insane when we know that eventually because you said you know i knew that i wanted to have a company one day or i knew that you know that was that was already in the back of your head and and so you had that intuitive feeling and even though starting your company wasn't you know right around the corner you still took the time to let yourself go down that rabbit hole and discover candor which eventually did you know become the company so that's cool yeah those origin stories Thank you. Um, so talk to me about candor in general. So what do you, what do you guys do, you know, and, and I'd like to, to kind of go through what you guys do as a company and then we'll kind of end um, and kind of transition into why you think the why of a company is so important. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we are a boutique Salesforce CRM consulting firm. Um, we, we are global. We are, somewhat industry agnostic. We have clients in every sector. And really, we focus on either implementing your Salesforce if you don't have one or working on the org that you have to ensure that you're using best practices. But really, it's about ensuring that you're using the org to the best potential for your business needs, your Mm -hmm. business operations. It's really very centric around the business and what you're trying to achieve out of the business, where your horizon is, and then working on the, working on the Salesforce platform to ensure that Salesforce, the tool, can support your business needs and operations to get you to your goals. Mm, mm. And when you say when you say global, like I just when when you first started growing the company, um, who, if you can talk about it, like who was your first international client, and what was that feeling like acknowledging that you had gone global? Um, so I can't, I, I won't disclose client names, but we, uh, one of our first international, we actually had two in the same week. It was, it was kind of crazy. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we signed, we signed a customer in, um, in the UK, they're in the oil gas sector where they actually have consultants that are like geologists and others who help oil companies figure out where is the areas they should dig for oil and mm. have like a least impact to the environment and things like that. And then another company that hired us was is in France. They're located in France um, as their HQ, and um, they're a consulting partner. So they're a consulting firm that provide their own consulting services in the industry, and they have their own Salesforce instance, and they mm. asked us to help with that. So it was it was funny because it was at the beginning of 2020. So the company is still fairly young. I mean, we're still very young. We're only three and a half years in. So that was about two years in. And we were just, the trajectory was starting to grow. And I didn't even realize we had gone international until I was just, one of my friends called and I was on the road a lot at the time. And she was like, Hey, what's going on? Where are you? What's happening? And I'm like, Hey, I'm great. We actually just signed some customers in UK and France. And she's like, oh, my God, you're international. And that's when I realized I was like, like, oh, crap, we are. Oh, my God. Oh, that's hilarious. I was in so, like, you know, focus, go, go, go mode. Just do right by the customer, get the contract right. out. Right? Yeah, I was yeah. In execution mode, then I didn't even take a step back to realize that I'd gone at that level. So. Oh man, yeah, you get <laughs> locked into some of those execution cycles, and it's yeah. refreshing to have somebody like objectively pop in from the outside and be like, "Whoa, what the fuck?" Right. You- <laughs> yeah. Hold on, say that again, but slower. Right. Like, <laughs> what did What did you just say? <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, so that's how I realized in early 2020, we went global, like literally a month before the pandemic hit, if that can tell you anything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's. I mean, and the pandemic's a whole nother topic. I mean, maybe we'll explore that a little bit later, but but for right now, so you so you went international, you know, you grew the company to the point where you've landed a, a, a company in France and the UK, um, and you were able to scale the company, um, you know, through a, a myriad of factors, I'm sure, and we could discuss a, a whole bunch of those different things on, in, <clears throat> at any length of time. But one thing that I'm really curious about is your um, your anchor in this idea of helping companies find their true north and really understand their why, you know, and why that's so important. So um, why don't we just dive into that? You know, where did that mentality come from? And and how do you really feel like it's benefited your journey? It came up, it, you know, it really came from experience. I've been doing consulting since I joined Accenture when I was 21, right out mm. of college. And um, I started off as testing software and then helping design it and build it. Um, just just for everyone's awareness, I have no technical background. That's probably, <laughs> that's one thing everyone should know. Like, I'm not a coder. I don't go in there. Like, the teams, the teams work on that. So I think that mm-hmm. also helped with the why because, you know, in my early on career as well, I always stayed on the other side of the implementations, meaning, like, the development team would build it. I would test mm-hmm. it. I would work with the clients to train them on it. I would work with the clients to gather requirements of what we needed to build. So I did everything in the SDLC, which is like the software delivery lifecycle, except the actual coding part. Mm -hmm. And through that journey, it was very interesting. My first project, the requirements were being given from an exec team. And we like worked day and night, month over month, getting this software built out. And when we decided to go live with it and we rolled it out for the users to use, it was actually very shocking because most of the users were like, this isn't what we do. This isn't our day to day. So, you know, that's when I realized the why is super important and getting the right people involved and asking. Man, I can't imagine like getting that feedback after because yeah. understanding all of the work that goes in to putting something like that out and then to get through the rollout portion and to have your end user be like mm, close right not quite right exactly exactly and i noticed that multiple times throughout my career you know um mm. if especially if i wasn't in that in that role where I could lead the requirements and really ask the whys and things like that. If I didn't have control in that project because I was a worker being not in the management realm, it was harder Mm. and you just had to do what you had to do. And, you know, not saying that management did anything wrong. It was just part of, it was a perpetual problem that existed, but it wasn't a problem that anyone realized existed at that time because that's just how consulting, that's just how consulting was yeah, so, yeah. I, I always try to like in, inside of that vein specifically, I, I, I'd like to to give these different types of examples when I think about like indoctrinated problems. You know, I, I, I always bring up um, back in the day, you know, in the I think like 1600s, 1700s, um, there was you know this mass issue of women just dying after childbirth and nobody could figure out why. Right. And it was during a lot of times like um, pre and post plague. And then even into the 1918, 1920s, after the pandemic flu hit all and one guy was like, hey, doctors that are delivering babies, maybe we should wash our hands between handling corpses and delivering babies. And that would really help reduce the death rate because there might be stuff on our hands that we can't see that is killing these people. And everybody was like, nah. Good try. That doesn't Mm -hmm. exist. We can't see it. It's not a problem. And then he starts washing his hands on a regular basis before deliveries and massively drops the the death rate, you know, in these in in women after childbirth. And it's kind of the same thing, you know, like you're talking about this this issue of not really identifying the end user and really empathizing with their needs and kind of reverse engineering a project. 
as as much as the, the term reverse engineering and user experience and everything like that, those buzzwords are being thrown around now. They weren't existent forever. Yeah. You know, they haven't always yeah. been that way. Exactly. Yeah. And also like the approach was a little different, right? Like I know now everyone knows what agile or scrum is, but Mm -hmm. you know, when I started my career, that wasn't a thing. It was waterfall. I still remember when agile was just a buzzword and, um, I was only like four years into my career. And one of the managers is like, Hey, there's this new thing called agile. I'm going to go get some training on it. I'll let you know how it goes. And it was just something new and it was so, it hadn't been proven yet. And people were trying it out, but weren't able to implement it. But now everyone in the industry uses the agile approach because over time we realize as you're designing, as you're building, you need the flexibility to make tweaks, make change your mind, or now that you've conceptualized it and actually like, instead of just talking about it in a theoretical way, but actually seeing a proof of concept, then you realize, Hey, I thought I wanted this, but actually I need this. Or, oh, I thought it was going to look like this when in reality it looked like something else. It gives you that room for flexibility and flow and just having those discussions, which is also how the industry's changed a lot. But those experiences in the past were really what drove me to the why. I mean, I'm still surprised at times where some of our, some of our clients that come to us, they've had experiences where they've, had, they've worked with others and they just haven't been able to and get the results they're looking for. And part of the reason is it, it's, um, I like to say it's a collaborative fault in the sense that the customer mm. has, doesn't have the ability to convey exactly what they're looking for. And sometimes mm. the consultant, the consultants also don't have the ability at times to ask the right questions mm. As we get so we get so bogged down on technology at times. So one of the things we like to do, and this is this isn't something Candor does uniquely. It's part of the new methodology. Is you know when you go into design sessions or discovery sessions, put technology aside, have very technology agnostic conversations, and talk about the business and the business mm-hmm. operation. Right? It shouldn't be. How do I change my business to fit the tool that I just bought? Because I invested a lot of money into this tool. It should be, I just bought this tool and I invested a lot of money. How is this tool going to work for my business? Mm -hmm. And we, a lot of times, get sucked into, well, the tool can only do this, so let's change our process. Versus, have we evaluated that the tool is the right tool? And have we discussed and thought about ways that the tool can be flexible, moldable, customizable to fit our needs. Yeah. I think it's such, when I first got into this space, um, and Apex has been around for two years now. Yeah. Right around there. Um, and people would always ask me, you know, how the hell did you go into the marketing world with a nursing and clinical psych degree? Um, and actually like, you know, successfully start scaling something. And um, to your point about, you know, you're talking about the other consultants and, and either the client having the inability to express their needs or the consultant having the inability to ask the questions. That was literally two thirds of nursing school, how to get somebody to express their needs comfortably in a right. situation where they have space and then how to ask open-ended questions to really get to the root cause, not just a symptom that's masking it. And I, um, I always tell people if I can walk into a patient's room, like I did when I worked on the cardiac ICU and convince a person that has five chest tubes sticking out of their chest and has a 12 inch incision in their sternum to get up and walk because I know that it'll be beneficial to them in the long run. I can, you know, work with a business and convince them to do something that, you know, maybe, and I don't even know if convince is the right word, educate them on why doing something that might be a little bit uncomfortable or painful at first will have massive long-term return. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, especially like when you're working with patients, asking the why and just digging in with the right questions, you get to the root cause sometimes in those underlying questions rather than, Hey, I'm here because my stomach hurts. 
Right. Oh yeah. The amount of times that I was in the <laughs> ER and <laughs> people would come in and be like, yeah. Oh, I'm like, did you, did you take some Pepto? You know, or right. maybe it's not stomach cancer. Maybe we need some gas X in our lives. We hit up right it. Um, but the thing is too, is that you have to balance it because every single person, when they're experiencing that pain, if they manifest themselves to the ER, and this is something that's critical about ER training is that when they come, you have to, you know, you can't invalidate their feelings. You know, right. what they, what they're experiencing to their level of perception is real. So you, you know, ask questions to try to draw out, well, why do you believe this is X? You know, I, I, I think that that's a really interesting thing. Have you um, encountered or does any specific example come to mind when uh, if you were to uh, think about backing a client offer, asking a why question has actually saved time or um, stood out to you as like, wow, like I'm really glad that this is my approach? Yeah, man, many of times because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, many of times because there are <laughs> there's been so many times where we go in and clients will come to us and be like, yeah, we have, we know exactly what we want. We have this 20 page document. We spent months on it. We, we, our requirements are really solid, probably like our team knows what we want. So let's just jump into, let's just jump into the implementation and I'm like, that's great. Not saying that your team didn't know what the, doesn't know and your requirement document isn't great, but our team still needs to ask certain questions. Right. And it is, it is not surprising for us, at least. It's very surprising on the client side every time is even if they felt they did months of this prep work, we still within like the first few conversations have asked questions that they did not consider. Yep. It's that amazing what an external objective opinion can do. Right. They it's, never thought about of like, you know, especially because, and it's not a fault of theirs in any way. It's also, you are hiring certain people to, who are familiar with the technology that's going to support this. Right. So as much as we're technology agnostic, we're also asking questions in relations to thinking about if we're going to use this tool, how are we going to build this tool? So some of the questions we ask, it might be the same question, but it's in a different flavor and it gets the mind thinking and it's like, oh, you know what? We didn't think about that. That I, That's a different flavor mind. of question. I love that you mixed the senses there. Like instead of, you know, a different phrasing of a question, like a different flavor, like it's just subtly, you know, it still gets the same thing across, but you know, maybe it's a little bit spicier, a little bit sour or you know yeah. something that just slightly different that sets off their senses in a way that's like oh huh like that yeah exactly it's the aha moment like oh yeah we did not think about this and then you know that's when the that's when the wheels and that's where that discovery and the why is so important because now we're mm. really 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 looking deep under the hood not just the surface level of the car, but really digging into the little or parts that are underneath that are hidden from, from, uh, you know, the naked eye. And that, yeah. that's the conversation. And that's the why, because sometimes what happens is like, Hey, Pulvi, we want, we want this. So our results can be X, but, but the results of X is like, that's still, if you, if we go back to your medical stuff, it's still a symptom. It's not the right. diagnosis. So it's like, okay, but you want X. Why do you want X? What is the purpose of X? And they're like, well, Z. I'm like, okay, but what's the purpose of Z? And then sometimes Z is the right answer. And that's what they were really trying to get to. Because then we're like, okay, what you're really asking for is Z. You're not asking for X. You're asking for Z. And they're like, yes, I agree. Or sometimes we're going even further into more layers to get to that real thing that they're looking for. A lot of times it's, hey, we're really looking to get the data, but it's like, okay, but why do you want the data? What are you going to do with the data? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm that trying is such to an important question. Like I, I, the amount of people that I've talked to and, and, and for those of you listening that haven't really experienced a lot of what, what apex does or, or haven't heard about it in a little while, you know, we're, um, small scale, like small to medium sized business, um, marketing analytics and, and, you know, Google ads, SEO, all of that kind of stuff. 
the amount of times that people have been like, oh, well, I know that I need, you know, this lead capture for this. And I'm like, okay. Or they know that they're like, oh, I want you know, all of this work done in Google Data Studio for for all of these things that they, they I need to collect data. Somebody told me that I need to collect data. And that's my first question is like, okay, what are we planning to do with it? And a, right. a lot of times they just kind of stop and they're like, um, I'm not sure yet. I'm like, okay, well, let's figure that out first because that's going to kind of dictate how we set this up. Yeah, and Salesforce CRM is the same thing, right? Like it is such a powerful tool and it can house so many different levels of data, slicing and dicing, but what are you going to do with that information? Mm -hmm. And really taking that information and saying, okay, maybe I'm trying to increase my CapEx. So let's look at where we are with our pipeline and how much we've, what have we done this year? How, what are our targets for next year and year over year growth? Where, where are we spending? You know, there's different ways. Maybe it's, hey, we're trying to land 10 new clients this year. And right. so, okay, where are we with that? So it's like, what do you want to do with that data? What is your objective? What are you trying to get at? And how does this serve your overarching goal of where do you want to go as a company? Does this align with yeah. your overall North Star, right? Like, are you going the right way? Or have you gotten distracted now by the shiny objects along the way and you were missing missing where you want to go? So asking those questions, those why, really helps build a foundation. And it also helps un uncover all the things. Because when you're building when you're building an org like Salesforce, you really want to try to understand the holistic picture of, of the entire org. So that way you can lay the foundation and the framework in the right way. And that saves companies a lot of time, dollars, and investment, and also provides a way to build a robust system right away and be able to scale and grow and maintain it in, in the best way possible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, are you, are you an avid reader or podcaster or like what is your consumption of information in your off time conversations Ooh, good answer conversations that's cool so oh, how do you how do you get your conversation fix i it, i meet with a lot of different people in different industries and just you know like i i've been blessed with the work that i've done in the 15 years now i've met a lot of cool people and you know i'll just I'll ask for 20 minutes to have an hour of their time and just pick their brain or, mm. and, mm. and then some of it is, you know, reading quick articles, staying, staying fresh. Um, I love reading TechCrunch and Ted talks, uh, like listening to Ted talks or sometimes just reading the transcripts if I don't have time to listen to something and, you know, um, just doing a little bit of that. And, but mo mainly conversations surrounding myself with like-minded people, I know you mentioned you've had other indie people. I've been talking to a lot of the indie people, getting mm. information from them. Um, my mentors, others in the industry, other entrepreneurs who are doing either similar work or completely different work just to get ideas. Yeah. I think that that's so important. I think um, there's a lot of people, at least um, I'm noticing it more so with Gen Zs because I'm, I'm doing a lot of mentorship right now with Gen Zs. Um, and their initial instinct seems to be, at least from as far as I can tell, um, when they're seeking the answer to a question, their initial instinct is to check social or Google it um, to try to either find some type of validatory um, mechanism, like somebody else posting about it, you know, or they just ask Google, and if Google doesn't have an answer, then they're like, oh, it must be a dumb idea because somebody else hasn't already thought of it. And I thought that was so insane. I had four or five different people tell me that. And I was like, if, old, if they would just have conversations with mentors or with mm -hmm. people like their tribe, you know, yeah. that outlook would be completely different because then the entire goal would be like, oh, you didn't find it on Google? Freaking awesome. That's good. That means that you had like an original idea. Maybe we vet it out a little bit and you run it up against a couple of potential roadblocks and, you know, well, what about this or what about this? Instead of just taking it and kind of chucking it out the window because you didn't find some type of validation when you were searching for it online. 
So I think that's actually really powerful. That answer was really cool. I haven't gotten that yet. Thank you. Yeah. Conversations. I mean, I've always, I've been blessed. I've had amazing mentors. I've seeked out. I mean, in my mentoring sessions and, you know, mentoring talks I do, I always tell people, everyone on the executive level is lonely. They love when people reach out to them for five minutes of their time because they want to, everyone loves to talk about themselves, you know, and especially on the exec level, just seeking someone out and being like, Hey, how did you get there? What did you do? What was your journey? Really? You know, you, you can take nuggets from that and apply it or just keep it as knowledge for future and having different perspectives. I have mentors in various industries that are into some of the industries are industries I've never worked in, but just even getting their perspective has always helped. So if we were going to try to give somebody advice on how to approach a mentor, how to draw a mentor in to have a conversation with them, do you have any like nuggets that you've used or conversation starters, or do you just kind of let it go organic and you just happen to find people that like talking to you? It's a, it's a bit organic, but some of it's a bit strategic. Like the best one is, um, the best story I have is when I was at Accenture, one of the top people, Accenture US came to our project to do a small speaking engagement. And she, she ended up being the, like she led all of Accenture US to a certain degree at some point. And, um, before she did that, she was pretty high up still. After the com- after her speaking engagement to our group, I just walked up to her and I was like, I was really impressed. Would you have, could I swing by for 15 minutes at some point? And she's like, yeah, um, work with my admin to schedule it. I scheduled it. I sat in her office and she's like, what's up? And I literally just asked her, I'm like, how do I get to your chair one day? How do I get to sit where you're sitting one day? Hmm. Mm. Um, because at that time there weren't that many female leaders in that industry. And so from there she gave me some advice. And then from there I just asked her, I was like, would you mind if I reach out to you for more advice in the future? And she's like, not at all. And then over time, you know, I never asked, I don't think I officially ever asked her to be my mentor, but it just turned into that mentorship relationship. Whereas others well, you started I a have, friendship, you took a leap yeah. and you were willing to ask a question to form a friendship, which, you know, turned into mentorship. I, I always yeah. like I try to tell people, like, don't look at a mentor as like some weird, like wizard outside of your realm of, you know, understanding that's bestowing wisdom upon you. Like my one of my closest mentors is a is a SaaS sales operative from IBM and he's my dude. Like I love John, you know, we host podcast together. Um, but he also holds me accountable and I talk to him once a week. And yeah. And some people you just like, some people have gone up to and, you know, after one thing is always be genuine. If you're, right. if you're being fake or you're showing that you're in it for a reason, that's to like, you know, that you're only looking to gain something for yourself, probably not going to work out. If you're genuine and to your point, like, all of my mentors are good friends of mine mm-hmm. where we had that genuine connection, that human connection. And mm-hmm. through that, as we develop that human connection, that's when I've asked them, Hey, would you mind mentoring me? Like mm-hmm. I would love to just have you mentor and coach me because I want to get closer to some of the idealisms I see in you and be able to learn and hone those skills for myself. But yeah, also with me, always had candor. Yes. That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> like have. this story is just confirming have. this, that, that <laughs> you just like the, the quality of being open, frank, and honest is yeah. just permeating throughout your storyline. It's beautiful. <laughs> it, I mean, it really goes to, if you're just a good human being and you're genuine, people are open to having a conversation. Conversations cost nothing, minus some Amen. time. It costs time. And as long as you make that person feel valued for the time they spend, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I tried to add like a little bit of, um, psychology into it whenever I'm explaining it to, um, 
I say kids like they're so much younger than me, um, <laughs> but, you know, like college students. And, and I tell them, I'm like, listen, when you're approaching a mentor, I was like, they can, it, it's almost um, like you can, I don't want to try to figure out how to phrase this. Like you can almost smell ingenuineness on somebody when they're asking you something, you know, like you could, you could feel it when, when you can tell that they're sideways intention, like there's just something that they want to gain or they're, you know, strategically trying to place themselves in a position for growth or whatever like that. And I'm like, if you really want that true mentorship, ask about something that they will feel comfortable answering because most people that are in that mentorship role, to your point, that are at that executive level or they're higher up in the tier, they're lonely, mm-hmm. potentially. You know, they get, they're really busy. Everyone's always asking them for something and they very rarely get to sit down and have conversations that are very intimate like that especially with somebody that is as forward as that. And, and just being willing to go in there and ask them and say, hey, I want to sit down and have a genuine conversation about how you've done what you've done. Not, I, I'm not asking you to help me with anything. I'm not asking you to like, you know, sign a promotion thing for me. I don't want your mentorship because of, you know, X, Y, or Z. I genuinely want to know about your journey and you would be surprised how much you learn just from asking other people about where they've been yeah exactly and that has that has served me really well throughout my life and helped me with where i am with candor today my mentors have guided me i mean all my mentors have not guided me in how to start a company but the skill sets they taught me along the way the things they the lights they shined upon me and the guidance they gave me to keep me on track and hold me accountable. That's another great part of mentorship is they do hold you accountable in a good way. Right. And that all of that, all of that has paid off. All of that is now surfacing into developing the company. And some of those mentors still today play a big part in helping me grow and stay true to what, what candor is and where candor should go. Yeah, I agree. Well, man, I, so I think that, um, I think that we're, this is a good place to, to wrap it up. I, I, um, I mean, just the, from being able to understand the why, you know, not being afraid to be frank and honest and have a little candor in your life and, and understanding that mentorship and, and being willing to ask questions, is so, so important. I think that we've learned a lot um, today and I appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk to me. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was amazing. I loved this conversation. No problem. So so for all of the peoples that are on the other end of this microphone with earbuds in their ears or us coming through their car speakers, where can they find and learn more about you? They can find me on LinkedIn or go to our website, candorconsult.com. And that for everyone listening, that's K-A-N-D-E-R consult.com. If you try to Google the word candor, it's C-A-N-D-O-R. But, you know, she adapted the spelling a little bit. So we'll make sure that you understand that link. And we'll post everything in the bio and everything too. So awesome. Yeah, and for anyone listening, if you – please do not hesitate to reach out. I would love to hear from you. If there's anything I can do to help you with your journey, happy to help. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I would love to include um, me and you can talk after the after we close out. I'll, I can include an email or something inside of the show notes. Perfect. That way, people that way people can reach out to you if they have any questions, Perfect. which I would highly encourage. If anybody listening, I would highly, highly encourage um, taking her up on that offer. So hopefully, um, you know, the all audience doesn't all respond at once. But mm-hmm. until uh, until next time. I hope that you guys have had an amazing experience today. And as always, keep chasing your apex.